I'm having a great summer, loving doing some kayak and riding my bike and hanging out with my grandkids at the beach. Just been a great summer. I hope you're having a great summer. We're in a series this summer at Bayshore called Crazy Church People. And it's uh, one of my favorite studies because I love to just study books of the Bible, kind of go through chapter by chapter, dealing with the stuff that's there. And so we've been looking at 1 Corinthians this summer, and it is called Crazy Church People because there's so many crazy things that are happening in the church of Corinth. So these are our kind of people. They had issues. They had all kinds of struggles. They had questions. They were new believers. They had been following Jesus maybe a year and a half, two years, and they didn't know anything about Christianity. They didn't know how it worked in their marriage and their sex life and their money and their conflicts with others. They didn't know how any of this worked. And so Paul wrote to them, helping them to understand how to live the Christian life, which is a big uh, mission of Bayshore. It's not simply to come to Jesus and meet Jesus, but it's how to live this out in our daily life. So that's part of what we do. So today we get to an interesting chapter, chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians. And uh, this is a chapter where uh, Paul is dealing with his, his tension between the Corinthians. Now, there's, a th- there's something that was going on between uh, Paul and the Corinthians, and there was this always a struggle uh, with his authority. Uh, the Second Corinthians is all about that, you know, Paul defending his authority, and they weren't really respecting him. Paul was sort of the Rodney Dangerfield uh, of the New Testament when it came to the church of Corinth. He didn't get any respect, and he had to really deal with that. Part of the reason they didn't maybe respect him is that he didn't take a paycheck from them. And they thought maybe, uh, you know, maybe because he didn't ask for money to get paid, maybe he wasn't really uh, that good of an apostle, basically. Uh, there were other apostles that they had a lot of respect for. Peter, uh, Cephas is how his name is mentioned here. Cephas is the Aramaic name for Peter. So Peter, in, in this text is mentioned, he and his wife would come to Corinth. And of course, Peter walked with Jesus. He walked on the water with Jesus. So Peter's a big deal. They paid Peter, supported him, but uh, they, Paul didn't take a paycheck. So they didn't respect him. They were having some issues respecting him. Uh, A couple other visitors that came to Corinth, according to this passage, is the brothers of Jesus. Did you know Jesus had brothers? They were born to Mary and Joseph after Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Mary and Joseph had regular relationships, and they had regular children. And one of those children was was the name was James. And James wrote one of our New Testament books. The book of James was written by Jesus' brother. So Jesus' brother James would visit Corinth with his wife, and uh, that was a big deal. You know, James, the brother of Jesus. What was it like with Jesus growing up? They would ask him. So, James got a lot of respect, and then James had another brother that was also the brother of Jesus, Jude, who wrote a book in the New Testament called the Book of Jude. And so, when Jude and his wife would come to Corinth, big deal, but Paul, not such a big deal. They took him for granted. Maybe you've ever, maybe you felt taken for granted sometimes in your life. You know, maybe, you know, you're, you're, you're the wife at the house and you're cooking and you're doing all that and they just scarf down the food, don't appreciate you. That's sort of Paul's thing. So uh, let me read a little bit this to you and then we'll get into this. Uh, am I not free? He says in chapter 9 of verse 1, Paul says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? So you can hear he's trying to defend himself. Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Verse 3, this is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have a right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brother and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? So you can see there he's defending his apostleship. Now, what he, he, what he does here is he gives the qualification, the primary qualification to be an apostle. The primary qualification to be a New Testament apostle. Now, there's a big argument about are there like apostles beyond the 12 apostles? And probably the answer to that is yes, but there are unique apostles. And here are the unique apostles in the New Testament. What was the primary qualification to be an apostle? What was the primary qualification to be an apostle? They were people that had physically seen Jesus raised from the dead. That was the qualification. That's what he says here in uh, verse 1. Have I not seen Jesus my Lord? So in order to be an apostle in the New Testament, you had 
to physically witness the resurrection of Jesus. And Paul said, I have seen Jesus. I saw Jesus alive. And we know from his uh, testimony on the road to Damascus that uh, he saw Jesus alive. And of course, Peter, James, and John, they saw Jesus alive. And so these 12 apostles, what's the primary function of them? What's the primary function? Why do we have the New Testament? The New Testament is written by the living voice, the people that saw Jesus alive, raised from the dead, and they bore witness that, listen, we saw him alive, and it says in the book of Acts, over a period of 40 days, Jesus appeared to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. Now, maybe this week, you haven't had a great week. Maybe you've, like, maybe not felt the Lord. Maybe you've been reading your Bible, and you're in the book of chronicles and your devotions karen just finished chronicles in her devotion and i just got into chronicles and so you know you're asking the lord what is this here for what is this here for you're reading chronicles and maybe maybe you sometimes you don't feel the lord in your faith and you just don't feel much like a christian let me just ask this question have you ever felt like you know i'm not feeling it it doesn't seem very real to me this week have you ever experienced that just raise your hand if you've ever experienced that almost all of us have experienced that like where is the lord i mean i'm reading the bible i'm not getting anything out of it came to church last sunday heaven knows what pastor danny was talking about i know what he was talking about but anyhow you know you have you have those times when you feel like it's not real but your faith is not built on your emotions your faith is not built on what you feel your faith is built on the facts The facts are that there are 12 ancient men who witnessed the resurrection of Jesus. They saw Jesus alive, and they bore witness in the New Testament that the the God who made Israel, the God who brought forth the Messiah, that that Messiah was crucified on the cross, and he was raised from the dead, and you are redeemed by that God. God has redeemed you. He has his hands on you, and the very God in history who changed the world and who raised Jesus from the dead is your Lord, regardless of what you feel like or not. Can you say a big amen? So I, if I ever have one of those weeks where I'm reading First Chronicles and I'm not getting anything out of it and I'm not feeling God and maybe Karen and I had a little argument and I'm just not feeling like a Christian, I'm telling you what, I remember, I remember when I pick up my Bible, it is witnessed of people who saw Jesus raised from the dead, not one person. If it's one person, you think, well, that person made it up, not two people. Well, that's pretty good if you've got two people that witness something. Not three people, but 12 apostles. And then it says in 1 Corinthians 15, which we haven't gotten to, at one point Jesus appeared to 500 people at once. Many who are still alive is what it says in 1 Corinthians 15. Many who are still alive. Why does it say that? It says that so if you have any questions, if you're reading the book of 1 Corinthians in, in the first century, you can say many are still alive. You can still check those out. There's people walking around the earth that saw Jesus alive. So Jesus is alive. His resurrection is the basis of your faith. I did a wedding uh, for Charlie White not too long ago. Charlie White used to sing on our worship team. She was raised in our church. And uh, she got married to Daniel Wilson. And uh, they got married in Edgewater, Maryland. Edgewater, Maryland is over near Annapolis. And so we went, Karen and I went on a Saturday to perform Charlie's wedding. We've known Charlie since she was a little girl. So she said, Pastor Dan, would you please do my wedding? It's on Saturday. It's in, it's in you know, got to go through Annapolis. And it's over there, you know, in Edgewater, Maryland. But will you do the wedding? I said, absolutely, Charlie. You've sung on our stage forever. I could not say no, absolutely. And so we drove through all the traffic in Annapolis. And we went through trying to find Edgewater. And we finally got to this beautiful place on the bay, Chesapeake Bay, where Charlie got married. And she got married on a pier, on a pier. Now, there's about 40 people out on this pier and I'm out on the pier and I'm in Edgewater, Maryland never been Edgewater, Maryland before and I'm on a pier standing on the edge of the pier at Edgewater, Maryland and I'm thinking there's a whole lot of people on this pier there's a whole lot of people and my wife's on the pier I'm on the pier 30, 40 people on a pier and it looked like the pier had been there for a while the, the, the wood was a little old I'm thinking are we going to survive this is this going to be on America's Funniest Videos what's going to happen here but I did that wedding and the pier held us up held all that weight all of us, all of us stood on that pier without incident because the pier was solid And your faith is solid. 
Your faith is solid. That's why you should read the Bible. Read the New Testament every day. Ask the Holy Spirit. Read the New Testament. Let the Holy Spirit teach you. And every day that I read the New Testament, I'm reading. I'm growing in my faith as a pastor. I'm growing in my faith as a believer because I know that Jesus has been raised from the dead. He has been raised from the dead. And what I believe in is true. It's validated. It's verified by witnesses. Do you ever think about why? Why did Peter on the day of Pentecost stand up? He got to be the guy that preached the gospel message. The first gospel message in the New Testament era was preached by Peter. And remember what he did 50 days earlier. He had denied the Lord and messed up. How many know that God can still use you even if you mess up? Say a big amen. Amen. Say this with me. God can use me even if I messed up. So Peter, the mess up, stood up to preach the gospel message. And here's what it says. He stood up with the 11. He stood up with the 11. The 11 apostles stood up with him. Now, why is that? You ever thought about it? You read that in the book of Acts. He stood up with the 11 and preached the message. Why did he stand up with the 11? Was it for moral support? I mean, the Jewish people, they were a little, you know, they were a little unpredictable. They had crucified Jesus, and maybe he needed that moral support, and they were there, and they were saying, amen, Peter, preach it. Go on, get it going, man. Shuck the corn, man, do it. Maybe it was for that, but it wasn't really for that. It was because they stood up as a witness. All of them had seen the witness of the resurrection, and they stood behind Peter, and as Peter preached about the resurrection, they're all nodding their head. We saw it. So Peter, in this, in this text, Paul says, Am I not an apostle? I have seen Christ Jesus our Lord. So an apostle is someone that has seen the resurrection of Jesus. And the resurrection of Jesus. So in Paul, he begins in this uh, chapter to challenge, to challenge his authority as an apostle. To challenge his authority as an apostle. And so he's defending that he's an apostle because they're not respecting him. They respect Peter. Peter's married. God, he brings him and, and Peter and his wife come to Corinth. And they like put him in the uh, their mata and give him a big suite. And they pay their money, pay him money and feed him and all that. And Paul's not getting that. And there's an interesting thing in the text. Peter and his wife. Did you know the apostle Peter was married? We know from the Gospels, he had a mother-in-law. If you got a mother-in-law, you got a wife. Peter was married, and Peter is the first. You know what Catholics believe? Any former Catholics here, or maybe you are sort of still a Catholic, you're raising a Catholic background. Catholics they believe, you know, Pope's not supposed to be married, nor the priest. Well, the first Pope was married. That's one of the problems there. That Peter was married, and so the first Pope was married. So I don't know what you do with papal succession with that. The first Pope was married, so I think they ought to let them all get married. Get all get married as soon as you can. Any of that's my opinion. I like to say something controversial every week, so there it is. There it is. So, but, uh, but his authority is being challenged, and Paul defends his authority in this text. Now, why is he defending his authority? It's not because of an ego issue. Paul has not got hurt feelings, and he doesn't have an ego. He doesn't have, like, everybody look at me. He doesn't, he's not upset about his lack of authority in the church because his ego is hurt and leaders cannot lead out of ego. Leaders must lead out of compassion and service. And Paul is not responding to an ego issue. He knows if he does not have a legitimate authority in their life, he cannot protect them from the things they need to listen to him about. Because he warns them in this uh, book, 1 Corinthians, about sexual immorality. He warns them about greed. He warns them about all these things. And if he has no authority, then he cannot cannot warn them about things they need to warn them about. And he needs to hold on to his authority so he can protect them. There was a little guy that grew up in our church uh, years ago, a guy named Donnie Ellis. His mom and dad, Tucker and Bonnie Ellis. Uh, Tucker was an elder here at our church. And... um, and uh, he was just a wonderful guy. And he, was, uh, he, he grew up in our church. He was a little boy. And he was here when he was real small. And when he grew up, he felt like he had a call to be a missionary when he was here. Uh, and a little boy, just in one service, he felt like the Lord was calling him missions. But anyhow, he became a doctor. And he does mission trips. He went to Duke University. 
and he became a, uh, a doctor, and we're also proud of him. He was from Del Mar, Maryland, went to Duke, became a doctor. He, he, I think he uh, works at Duke uh, Hospital there. He's a great, great, uh, great young man. He's got a big family. And he put this on Facebook yesterday. He said, uh, he said so this morning my youngest daughter ran into the kitchen and told me that the lights in another room had unexpectedly shut off. Next, the power in the family room fails. At that moment, I became aware of a clicking sound that seemed vaguely familiar, circuit breakers. I heard around the corner to find our youngest, a two-year-old, using a dog crate to gain access to the breaker box. He was, happily, he was happily turning off all the power to our house switch by switch. His little jaunt earned him an all-expense-paid trip to the corner. It's good they're so cute, and there's a picture of him. So when I read that, I thought, that is so funny. You know, and, and Donnie Ellis, Dr. Donnie Ellis, when he's correcting that little boy, his youngest little boy, it's nothing to do with his ego. It's nothing to do that he's angry. It's nothing to do that he's upset and that he's not being respected. It's not an ego thing. He's using his authority because he wants to protect that little boy. And he knows playing with a circuit box is not a good idea. And so when Paul is defending his authority, he's defending his authority because his authority is needed so that he can protect the Corinthians. And we need to respect spiritual authority in our life. We need to respect people that, that love Jesus and have been walking with Jesus. We need to respect spiritual authority. We need to respect people that can protect us from our moments of stupidity. And so that's an important thing. Another reason that Paul was defending his authority was because he wanted to use his authority so that they could be transformed and developed in Christ. Paul said in another place, he said, uh, my passion in life is to present the body of Christ as a spotless uh, bride before the Lord. He wants them to develop and become more like Jesus. So his authority is based on on that. His authority is based on presenting them and their, uh, to become more and more like Jesus. Transformation is one of the major passions of Bashor. We want to see people meet Jesus. We want to p- see people come to Christ, but we don't want them to stop there. You can come just as you are. You can come whatever issue you have in your life. You can, Bashor is open to everybody. Come however you want to come, but when you come here and you meet Jesus, Jesus does not expect you to stay that way. He wants to change you and sometimes our message in our churches modern churches are falling short of that come as you are absolutely we all buy that we all believe in that but after you come we want to see the holy spirit change you and make you somebody different and we don't want you to be the same person you were 10 years ago and so paul uses his authority amen (laughs) paul uses his authority to help them with that so I was, uh, I don't know if you've been watching the Olympics. I'm, I'm really, I've been into the Olympics, Karen. I've been watching it every night. We're just loving the Olympics and uh, all, the, all the, uh, the different things. It amazes me, amazes me, these Olympic athletes. It's just amazing. But, you know, swimming has been on a lot in the evenings. So we've been watching a lot of swimming. And I mean, are those people fit or what? I mean, those, I cannot believe it. Um, there was this one girl, her name is R. Uh, Arne Titmus, and she's a uh, 20-year-old girl, and she's from Australia, and she got a gold in the 400-meter and the 200-meter freestyle. And unfortunately, she beat out American Katie L- Ledecky. And, uh, but what really inspired me about Arne Titmus is his, her coach, Dean Boxall. And this guy, I, they showed videos of him coaching her. And I mean, he is in her face. And he's yelling at her, and he's saying, if you don't do this different, you're never going to win in the Olympics. And they showed him some of, they showed everybody some of his coaching sessions with her. And I mean, he's not worried about hurting her feelings. He is letting her have it. He's like pouring it on. And she's hearing that stuff, and she's taking it in, and she's just listening to him. And then when she finally won the Olympics, uh, won that gold medal, he went crazy. It went viral. He's jumping everywhere. He's like throwing stuff. He's just, he rips his mask off. He's so excited because he's excited because she has met her goal and she's moving forward and then there's this wonderful picture where they hug and they embrace each other it's an incredible thing so Paul is protecting his authority because he is their coach 
to help them become more like Jesus. So his authority, if you read 2 Corinthians and you read this chapter, one of the things that you're going to discover is Paul is defending his authority, and you see it begin in 1 Corinthians, and he's defending his authority so he can protect them and so he can develop them. Say it with me. He's defending his authority so he can protect them and develop them. Say it with, more, say it with me one more time. He is defending his authority that he, may, that he may protect them and he may develop them. So that's what's going on. So then we got this, this last thing we're going to cover today. And that's the deal with money. And Paul is not taking a paycheck. He's not taking any money. And what's really interesting about the text is he develops the idea that if you are in the ministry, you have a right to receive income from the ministry. I'm always grateful this is in the book, Bible. It's here, right here. <laughs> it's one of my favorite passages. I've been wanting to get to this, so here it is. Basher, by the way, treats me very well. I'm very, very grateful. But he defends this about, uh, he says in verse 6, Or is it only I or Barnabas who must work for a living? And here's what he says. He gives this argument. Who serves as a, as a soldier without his own expense? If you're in the military, you don't, you're not in the military and you don't have to buy your own uniform. You don't have to buy your own gun. You have to buy your own helmet. If you're in the military, the military supplies what you need to support you. They buy your groceries. They take care of you. And he's drawn a parallel. If you're in the ministry, if you're in the army of the Lord, just like if you're in the army, uh, the military, you get, you're, you get supported. Who plants a vineyard? It does not eat some of its grapes. So if you plant a garden, you eat the squash and, the, and all that. So he's using a natural argument. Who tends a flock and does not drink some of the milk? So if you've got you know, a herd of cows or sheep or goats or whatever, you milk them and you get some of the milk. Do I not say this merely from a human stand up standpoint? And then he goes to the Old Testament. Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses... Do not muzzle an ox while he is treading out grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? So he goes to Old Testament, Deuteronomy 25, 4. He says, now, here's a picture in the Old Testament. You got an oxen, and the oxen's plowing the field, and he's like, you know, pull, tre- or maybe pulling a, a threshing thing to, to pick the wheat or whatever. And the oxen, they don't put a muzzle on it. The oxen, while he's working in the field, gets to eat some of the grain from the field. So he's saying a minister, if he's working in the ministry, it's very, very uh, appropriate for him to receive income for what he does. Um, And verse 10 says, surely he says this, this is Paul saying, surely he says this uh, for us, doesn't he? Yes, it is written for us because when the plowman plows and the uh, thresher threshes, they do so in hope of sharing in the harvest. Verse 11, if we have sown, here's the principle, if we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much? If we reap a material harvest from you. So if you receive ministry, spiritual ministry, material uh, benefit comes back from that. That's his argument. And then uh, he says, if others have the right of support, don't we? And he goes on to this thing. Uh, And then he says this. Look, verse 14. In verse 14, he puts the ace card down. And he's developing an argument for ministers being paid. Uh, here's Here's the ace card. He said from, he gave natural illustrations. And then he gave an Old Testament illustration. Now, here's what he said, verse 14. In the same way, the Lord, Jesus, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. And this is found, interesting, this is found in Luke, uh, Luke chapter, I think it's Luke chapter 5. And uh, it's in there, Luke chapter 5. And it's a quote from the gospel of Luke, and it's also mentioned in Timothy uh, and Timothy. So very, very interesting. So he, 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 uh, he quotes Jesus. So Jesus commanded that a minister should receive support. What's really interesting about this, though, however, which is very important, is this, this epistle was written, uh, this letter from Paul was written in the 60s, 60 AD. So he's already quoting the gospel of Luke which means Luke was already in existence or was in, in, in process there. So that's a very interesting thing. But he quotes the Lord. So you would think, you would think, 
Paul's saying, you know, oxen shouldn't be muzzled, uh, soldiers need to support it, and Jesus said, a workman's worthy of its wages, and so you would think he's getting ready to ask for a raise. You would think he's getting ready to, I need some money. And then he turns it, he turns it, turns it on its head, and he said, but we don't use this right. We don't take, we have chosen not to take money from the church of Corinth. Now, we know that Paul was supported by the church of Philippi, but he chose, he chose to not take money from the church of Corinth. So he, he, gave, he gives a case for, you should be paid if you're a minister, and then he changes and he says, we didn't take that right. So what's going on here? He's showing them how to lay down their rights. He's showing them how to lay down their rights. Because in chapter 8, he, the, the whole thing about offering to idols and all that, he, cho- he said, even though you're free to eat meat sacrificed in the temple, because of your brother, you lay down that right. And he's talking about laying down your rights, and he's showing them how to lay down the rights. And it could be, you know, it could be some reasons for that. One reason was, you know, he says, I would do anything to make sure the gospel's not a stumbling block to anybody. And so maybe one of the reasons behind the scenes, part of the reason is, uh, is that he didn't want to be, he want anybody to think that he was in Corinth preaching for the money. And he wasn't in there preaching for the money because he didn't take any money. And I think that's a wonderful, wonderful point. Now, I've told the story before of this uh, guy I used to study. Uh, I used to learn, I studied his sermons, a guy named Fred Craddock. He was a professor at Emory University. And he was, when I was a young preacher, I read, I read all of his uh, things he wrote. I listened to all of his sermons because he was the best preacher I'd ever heard. And I wanted to learn how to preach and do better and be able to tell stories and do that. And so I, I studied Fred Craddock. But Fred Craddock told the story about his own life. He said his dad, when he grew up, his mom was a Christian, but his dad was not a Christian. And his dad, whenever there was, the pastor would come to the house, the mom would get the pastor to come to the house, try to get the pastor to win her husband to the Lord. The husband would always say the same thing. The husband would say, the church doesn't care about me. All the church cares about is another name, another pledge, another name, another pledge. And whenever there was a revival at the church, the pastor would bring the evangelist to the house Fred said my mother would run into the kitchen, afraid somebody's feelings would get hurt. The evangelist tried to win uh, his dad to the Lord, and his dad always said, the church doesn't care about me. All the church cares about is another name, another pledge, another name, another pledge, another name, another pledge. Isn't that the name of it? He said, one time my dad didn't say it. My dad was in the hospital. He had throat cancer. He was down to 72 pounds. He had been through chemo. The radiation had burned his throat and had taken out most of his throat. And there was a tube down his throat. And he said, I flew in from another city to see my dad. And he said, when I flew in from another city to see my dad, I went into the room and I was shocked to see the condition of my dad, 72 pounds, the result of all that radiation. And he said, the room was filled with flowers. Flowers were on the the windowsill, flowers were on the floor. He said the whole room was full of flowers. He said the little table that they pulled out across your hospital bed had a stack of cards 15 inches thick. And there was a big plant on that table as well. And he said every flower, every petal, every card were from people in his mom's church. And his His dad, who couldn't speak, took a Kleenex box and he wrote with a pen words from Shakespeare on the back of that box. And he said, in this harsh world, draw your breath in pain to tell my story. And he said, Daddy, what is your story? And he wrote, I was wrong. I was wrong. Now, if you grew up in a situation where you think, all the church cares about is money. The average church in America is about 75 people, and most of the ministers in America work a part-time job. So regardless of what you see, televangelists, regardless of what you see somebody driving a Rolls Royce, regardless of what you see on the big screen of these people that just want your money, and there are people out there like that, they'll put the guilt trip on you. If you don't send me money today, this is going to happen to you. And if you send me this money, you'll have a $10,000 check in the mail before you know it. People that, that manipulate people like that. There are people like that in this world. 
But Paul was not like that. Paul was a man. Paul was a man who loved Jesus. And he said, I'm going to preach without any paycheck. I love you. I have authority in your life. And one of the reasons he may not have taken any money, it may have been some people that want to control him. If they're going to pay him, they can control him. And Paul maybe knew there were some people in Corinth, if you pay, a, pay you a check, we're going to try to control you. And any minister that's ever controlled by money has lost his prophetic voice to the church. We have to always be willing to say what needs to be said regardless of the consequences. And that's my commitment to you. I love you. I care about you. But let me tell you something. If Jesus tells me to say something and I find it in the word, I'm going to say it as loving as I can. And I'm not going to back away even if there are empty seats that occur because of it. Because we need people in this generation. We need millennial pastors to begin to rise up to speak the word faithfully, to speak it in love, and not to retreat from the word. Because the word is the same yesterday, today, forever. And the Lord will help us to change through his word. Can you say a big amen? So I got about four minutes, so let me finish up here today. Let me say this. Um, uh, good, good example, uh, Rick Warren. Rick Warren, you know, Rick Warren. How many know who Rick Warren is? Purpose Driven Life and Saddleback Church. You know, he wrote uh, Purpose Driven Life. And uh, after he wrote Purpose Driven Life, that did so well that he didn't take a salary for the rest of his ministry. And he took the money that he got from Purpose Driven Life and gave it back to the church and paid them back for all the salaries, never taken a salary since. They say, Pastor Danny, aren't you writing books too? Yeah, but my books aren't doing near that well. So <laughs> if you're thinking I'm going to do that, I'm not quite there yet. I want to say that. <laughs> but what can we learn about laying down our rights? We can learn this by laying down our rights. You know, sometimes you lay down your rights by not having to be right all the time. You don't have to win every argument Sometimes when you're in conflict with somebody, you don't have to, you know, argue and argue and, and, and prove that you're right. When Karen and I first got married, we had so many arguments, and the argument would be almost over with that first year. I mean, almost be over with, and I had to say one more thing. You ever done that? The thing's almost over. It's cooled down. I mean, the, the smoke has settled. It's almost over with. You're almost ready to go to bed and sleep. It's almost there, and then you have to say that one more thing, and it goes up all over again. How many of that ever happened? You know somebody. It hadn't happened to you, but you know somebody. <laughs> Sometimes you can be right and lose the relationship. Listen, let me just say this to you. This is something I believe, and this is my philosophy in life, and it's not everybody's philosophy in life. It is not my job to straighten out everything wrong in this world. It is not my job to straighten out everything that's wrong in this world. My job is to straighten out me. But with the Holy Spirit's help to straighten out me. And people live on a mission trying to straighten out everything that's wrong in this world. They're getting frazzled. They're getting frustrated. And there's a lot of things wrong in this world. But you're not called to straighten out everything in this world. You are called to straighten out yourself. And remember the bombshell theory uh, from uh, Alcoholics Anonymous? I can change no one by direct action. But others have a tendency to change as I change. Say that with me. I can change no one by direct action, but others have a tendency to change as I change. So you don't have to say that one more thing. You don't have to be right. I was just at a conference in Huntsville, Alabama with a lot of my college friends and the keynote speaker, I hardly agreed with anything he said. I thought it was, oh, I just was like, I was cringing through the whole time. And there was some other things in the conference that was good, but I mean, I just, it was not my job to make a big deal with my friends about that. It's just not my job. And you just have to lay down your rights is sometimes refusing to have to be right. And you don't have to straighten out everybody in this world. You can be at rest. Heard about the minister that was, uh, you know, he, he was, you know, he's in the ministry trying to straighten everybody out, try to straighten out, you know, John and Sally's marriage. And they didn't get straightened out. They got divorced, tried to straighten out Deacon Jones and couldn't straighten him out, tried to straighten out problems in the church, couldn't do it. Finally, he just quit and became a mortician. He said, now when I straighten them out, they're straightened. They stay straight. <laughs> Say this with me. I cannot straighten out this world. 
So lay down your rights. When you're, when you're, when you're obsessed with your rights, you've got to demand that people see it the way you see it. You've got to demand that. And it's a miserable way to live. If you lay down your rights, you don't have to control things. You don't have to control things. And if you grow up, grew up in a very dysfunctional family with a lot of problems in your home and there's a lot of chaos and there was alcoholism and there was a lot of craziness in your household, you probably grew up with a need to control things. And I have a tendency to need to control things. And there's certain things I'm called to control and lead, but generally speaking, I cannot control everything and I need to get used to that. Karen and I, uh, we go to the movies pretty much every Friday night. We are on a mission to bring movies back, and people aren't going to the movies much, but um, we go to the movies. We like to go to movies, and we, we, uh, my, my, in our relationship, we go to movies on Fridays on our date after lunch or whatever, and we, have, we, we try to find a good movie, and we go to movies, and we like to sit in the dark and hold hands and eat popcorn. That's what we do. And so, uh, but my deal is that I'm the guy that picks out the movie. I pick up the movies. I do the research, and I find the good movies. We went to see a good movie uh, Friday uh, with Matt Damon. It was really good. It had some language, but it was, a good, it was a good story. I like a movie with a good story. It's got to have a plot. A lot of car chases and a lot of shooting. That means they didn't have time to write a plot. That's what that means. <laughs> So it was a good movie, uh, you know, we saw, but it's a really good story. But the other, other week, I mean, I always pick the movies out. She said, I, I got the movie we're going to. Ooh, that was, that was a little hard for me to take there. I, <laughs> this is my one domain here. I, I control the movies where we go. She, nope, we want to see this movie. And um, I'm thinking it's, it's going to be awful. You know, I, I just, I do the research. I know these things. I have a sense for a good movie or a bad movie. I just go, oh, boy, it's going to be bad. We went and we saw this movie called Queen Bee. And it was this movie uh, about these uh, this basic nursing home people that fell in love. It was a really interesting movie. But it was really, really a good movie. It had a great story. It had to do with the issue of mortality. The issue of growing old, being alone. And it was a really, really good movie. I walked out of the theater. I knew I had to tell her. I didn't want to tell her, but I had to tell her. <laughs> good job. Good job. That's a good movie. One of the best movies we've seen the last couple months. Very good job. She said, I knew it would be a good movie. I knew it would be a good movie. But giving up the need to control. When you lay down your rights, you don't have to control things anymore. And the best way to get out of the control mode is to let Jesus be in control of your life. And when Jesus is in control of your life, you don't have a compulsion to have to control things. And if you're here today and you've never met Jesus and Jesus is not the Lord of your life and you haven't let the Holy Spirit come in you and give you peace and guidance and Jesus is not the one that has forgiven all of your sins, then you're going to constantly want to control things in this crazy world. But we that know Jesus are a part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And we have security because Jesus has been raised from the dead. Paul saw him. James saw him. John saw him. They all saw him. And they bore witness that he's the Lord. Let's bow our heads right now and close our eyes and we're getting ready to have our final song, a great final song as we end today. But if Jesus is Lord of your life, just raise your hands to him right now and say, Lord, I know you're raised from the dead. You are the Lord. I believe in you. I accept you. I know you're the king. doesn't matter what happens in, on CNN or any news network, whatever we see, there is a God who rules the universe that will bring his kingdom to pass. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, just kind of wave your hand right now and we're going to pray with you. And let's all pray the prayer that we need to pray in order to receive Jesus. And if you never received Jesus, we want to ask you to pray this prayer with us right now. Let's pray it together. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. You are the only way that I can be forgiven of my sins. I have sinned in many, many ways. And I ask you, Lord, to forgive me on the basis of the blood of Jesus to cleanse me of every sin. And I turn to you and I make you Lord of my life. And let's all say this together. I believe that you are the Son of God and that you've been raised from the dead and now you are my Lord. I receive you. 
And if you just prayed that prayer, please let us know today. Next step is to be baptized, to bring your friends, and to celebrate your new life through water baptism. We thank you, Lord. If you love Jesus, say a big amen. Let's give the Lord a big praise offering.